Roll call, please. Mr. Mazzarini? Here. Mrs. Patel? Here. Mrs. Lesnick? Here. Mr. Flora? Present. Mr. Kramer? Here. Mr. Kearney? Here. Mr. Kaczynski? Here. Ms. Kearney? Here. Thank you. <coughs> we do have a recognition, Chuck. Yeah, we do. Thank you. I'd like to recognize the board this evening, Senior Will Pfeiffer. Will is the lone student in Chartier's Valley who achieved commended status in the National Merit Scholarship Program. He is one of, what they say, the top 5% of nearly 1.6 million students who take the PSA. Congratulations, Will. Awesome. Great job. At this time, I'd like to ask if anybody, and I'm glad to see the, the uh, room so full tonight. We're, we're, we're excited when people are excited about our district. So good to see everybody here. If anybody has a public comment, please step up to the microphone, give us your name and address. <laughs> Hi. Hi. I'm Kathy Comas. I live at 291 Foxcroft Road, Pittsburgh 15220. Thank you, Kathy. You're welcome. <laughs> so, first, I want to thank you for everything that you doing and for having school start on time and um, yes unfortunately I can't always get to the meetings but I do go on the website and um, read the information that's provided there and so that's what that is why I'm here and that's what prompted me to send an email to all the school board members on um, September 27th and I also copied um, Mr. McCartney on it in regard to the Short Coast Valley Lady Cold Soccer Team. And um, I had sent it to let you know that we had two upcoming events. One was on October 2nd, where we ha um, had senior night and we had 17 seniors um, being honored that night. And the other one was on October 4th, the team was having a peak out night to benefit living beyond breast cancer. So I wanted, I asked. If you were able to attend, please do. Um, and I want to say that mainly, well, two reasons. I mean, I'd like to recognize our girls. I thought 17 seniors on the girls' soccer team was something that, I mean, I've only been involved in four years so far, but we've never had 17 seniors. But on the uh, Board of Education's homepage, the second goal is says to increase our community engagement. So I thought, well, I'll let you all know about the upcoming events. And I didn't hear back from any, anybody except Mr. McCartney that was copied on the email to let me know that he would tweet the information out for us. And I just wanted to ask if you all received the emails. Do you remember receiving the email? And um, like, like why somebody wouldn't even just respond to me and say, Thanks for letting us know 
some, something. Out of everybody that's sitting here, and this is Murphy on the phone, nobody responded. So that's why I was here today. I was just rather disappointed that there was no response. I honestly didn't expect anybody to come. I know everybody is busy. But if you want to increase community engagement, you could maybe at least respond to somebody that was reaching out to you. Very valid point. I can't speak for anybody else. I remember reading the email. I remember wanting to check my schedule to see if I could come. And, and by the time I did, I never got back to you. I apologize for that. Thank you. I can't speak to anybody for anybody else. But I, I do remember reading it specifically. My daughter was a four-year soccer player here at the high school. She was a, uh, really enjoyed watching girls soccer for four years. And I thought to myself, I'd love to go. Check my schedule. It wasn't available. So I, I just forgot to get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, but we appreciate you reaching out because it would be something that, as board members, we, we try to engage in as many activities as we can, but it just doesn't always work. But you're right. Everybody deserves at least some response. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Sure. Anybody else? Superintendent's report. Well, we have a presentation for athletic department, Andy. <coughs> Hi, Angie. How are you today? Um, so, if, uh, one thing we need to improve always every year, I look at our department, what needs to get better? Um, and on top of our list is our communication. How can we, as the, my department, the two of us, um, <laughs> get better? Uh, we have a lot of things going on, you know, every day. Um, we're doing a lot of different sports, a lot of great kids, and obviously with um, Mrs. Thomas up here as well. Is how can we celebrate our kids? How can I do a better job of promoting our kids, whether it's an athletic achievement combined, and also our athletes with an academic achievement? So we want to try to find a way to be more efficient in our office and be able to get information out. So um, Chris is here, who's from Varsity News Network. Um, we'll talk a little bit about how we can update our website and how we can help our department be a little bit more efficient in sharing information um, and our coaches getting involved in that as well. Um, so if you have any time I can have sometimes eight sporting events going on in the day, I can have four at home, four away, uh, practices and things going on. And it's really overwhelming for two of us to try to update every single schedule when we have games and events going on. Um, and with the Varsity News Network, it'll give us a little bit more hands-on mobile freedom to be able to update um, our website. So the Varsity News Network will provide us with a new website, and it is completely mobile um, and apple to any device. Um, and Chris can kind of go into a little bit more of the details of it. Um, but I just want to talk a little about what I can use it for um, and how we benefit our kids and also, also our community and just to let kind of events going on. So the website, which we'll show you a couple samples, there are, are um, first that are based, based out of um, Michigan and they're starting to put their stamp on Western Pennsylvania. Um, right now, we have a list of, of, the, of the schools that currently have a website sponsored, sponsored um, by Varsity News Network. So they're standing here. Um, the, one of the first ones to be here was North Hills. And um, Kevin Dietrich, who's now the athletic director of the St. Clair, really got me interested kind of in this site and how it can um, improve the current site that we have. Um, and our current site is, is good, but it requires a lot of, you know, sitting on the computer, manually updating, adding things, and like I said, with all the events going on, um, having something that's more mobile and something that I can update on the spot um, and get up to the website. And then have also our coaches be able to have that ability to do that as well. So it'll have, our coaches will have the ability, they'll have an app on their phone, at whether it's a middle school soccer game, middle school swim meet, a high school game, that they can act, they can go on their phone and update the score of their events, um, and then it'll kind of get sent to the website, and then I can just go and approve it, and then it gets blasted out. So hit our Facebook page, Twitter, you know, we we pull in Instagram, and then also our website, so the scores are up there. Um, and as that score and thing gets updated, it also updates across our website. So where we have. The middle school soccer schedule will say, you know, we play Peters Township, we won 3 nothing, and it'll just have the score and everything will be ready. 
I think even personally as myself, I do a lot of outreaching to other sites to get our own information. So I shouldn't be going to the post of that. I should be going to um, you know, the Trib or MSA Sports to try to find and look for articles to repost on our site when we have the ability through this to be able to post um, stories about our kids and celebrate our kids on, on our site. And I think Chris said something earlier about how we can tell our story. Instead of relying on someone else, we can tell our story and who we are um, through our own eyes um, and kind of want to portray who we are that way. Um, so can you have a the other uh, Clair site? So this is two sites that are currently under, so Upper St. Clair sites are pretty, um, and I'll let Chris talk about a little bit of the advertising later. Um, but it features a lot of pictures, um, updated information um, that they can, coaches can just post, you know, their scores, whether they put, um, one sentence and say, you know, we won, here's the score, or they can elaborate a little bit more. Someone had a record for, you know, broke the school record for goals, or, you know, something something like that, or score their first career goal. We have, you know, various periods over here. So it gives a little bit more um, freedom to, like I said, tell our story. Um, this will also link, so we use the Our School Today, which is our scheduling site, um, which there's a link onto our current athletic page. This will make, those two sites will be able to marry, and then they will be able to display. So any changes we make in the one will then reflect that on our page, and then also be able to put alerts. Each team then will also have their own page. And then there you can look at schedule rosters, and then photos, and this is um, something Chris uh, talked to me, he was reminding me about earlier, is that our lab ability, whoever goes to an event, we can just take everything on our phone, um, and immediately upload it to the site and then have, you know, photo galleries. Uh, they're not going to be professional. Check with photos. Um, yeah. <laughs> Nobody can. But um, just to have more photos available of our kids, and obviously everyone loves to see photos of their kids often. Um, but I think it's a really neat, unique site. Obviously, it, it's, it, there's an initial fee, a $1,500 initial fee. But with the, with the advertising, um, we can then in turn make money. So it's a one-time fee, and then with those advertising, the more hits we get on our site, the more visits we get on our site, um, the more money we can get back. Um, There's a breakdown on the advertising. Sure. Um, <clears throat> I, uh, I'm the only one that would, you guys would allow me to go out on behalf of the school uh, to secure advertisers, and um, we, again, this is a one-time fee, it's not annual, uh, so we just charge you a one-time 1500 setup fee. And then I go out, uh, and it's, it's anywhere between 10 and 15 total advertisers. I might sell two, I might sell 15. Um, you're, uh, with your school district, it's probably going to be closer to, to 15. Um, but the breakdown is um, uh, a minimum of 10% of the revenue maximum of 25% for, for you guys. Uh, give you an idea on North Hills, they've been up for two years now. We've had some schools up for three years. Uh, they paid their initial feedback within the first year, and last year uh, I made them um, uh, another $2,200. Did you, when you say our, our site, is this a separate site, or is this a link to our existing website? This would be a separate site, but linked through our site. What we have all our schools do is uh, from the, the home web uh, home page, you know, your, your school site, uh, take all the athletic information on, off of there, put it all on one platform, so no one's searching in ten different places anymore to find it. Like, everything's right here. It's your own ESPN.com. Uh, just leave that athletics tab there and do what's called a three hundred one redirect. Click on it, goes directly to the uh, new website. We work with. Uh, it's like a link from our website to that website. Correct. Yeah. We work with over um, uh, 2,000 schools nationwide. We're just uh, fairly new in Western PA. And as you saw, we have uh, pretty pretty shortly, we have, well, quickly, we have about uh, 2,000 plus schools in, uh, in Western PA. I think one of the initial concerns of the board was that we want people directing to our site, not uh, away from it. And we were just concerned that that might be the case. We want people to go to our website, then click on there and go to get the sports information. Is that how it's going to work? Oh, yeah. Okay. What's yeah. going to prevent them from bookmarking this 
and not being able to go to my website anymore. Like once they initially do that the one time, can they just bookmark this? And then we don't, uh, we, right now we rely on a lot of people going to our website for athletics. And then they learn about a lot of other things that are going on in the district. Right. Where if we don't get them to our website by getting them there, luring them in to find out what the athletic schedules are or whatever, because they can, can they now just bookmark this? Sure. Then they're, we're not, we're going to lose that. We're not going to, you know. If they're only interested in athletics. Right. And they're certainly capable of doing it. Um, it there's, there's, and, and you can control the content on here, so if there's something important, like a, a prom or something, you know, something you want to get out to people, uh, you can post that here. Um, if this is the only site, you know, if you're not regularly going to the, the main site as well. Um, it doesn't have to be 24-7 sports. You control all the information that goes on here. So could you put a link on that site to say, let's say, school news or school updates? Hit that to go back to our website. Sure. Yeah, it's all it's like a blank canvas for you guys. And, and I would work directly with Chris as far as setting up what our page looks like. So he had to come up with like this is the template, this is what it looks like, and then I can work obviously with anyone that we would want to include back and forth. Like that's mm -hmm. that's great to kind of still keep those two. We are still want to keep everyone connected. And you can add some tracks like uh, uh, you see the. Uh, like the more tab here, that's that's where you would add um, as much as many links as you want. As far as um, uh, Kevin, I would say Claire, they just launched, so he's still working on this. He's busy posting, you know, on a daily basis. But general information, sports offer, championships, tickets. You can sell tickets right off your site. Uh, NCAA athletic physical form. Uh, you can make a whole new, you know. Uh, section regarding, you know, go back to the whole site, you can click on that and, and take them to wherever you want. Mr. Kelly, did you tell us, currently we track how many people hit our site, correct? We know, yeah, we, we know the analytics on that, so I mean, we could always implement it, see how it does, and take a, take a look at the numbers a year later and say, you know, how many people is it driving to our site or away from our site? Adjust, right? Yeah, adjust, adjust from there. From there. But I, I think it, it will be awesome for our coaches to be able to talk about our kids, for, for the athletic department to be able to talk about our kids, get the information out there easily, where it's not burdensome because that's what that's what stops people from doing it. Um, so I don't know anybody else knows about it, but that's my comments. So I have a question. Did you say, Angie, that the coaches can put out information about the games? Was it the coaches who could put the yeah, so everyone will have like a mobile app on their phone, um, and they can enter information, and then the person who asks Chris, what well, can I look at it before it gets posted, okay. like, and that is, that is what happens. So it'll get uploaded, and I will be, I'm the only one, or, you know, someone else, but Chuck, obviously, and anyone else, we will be able then to release it to the site. So it's not like there's no coaches immediately that's say right. whatever. <laughs> they want that's that's right. Right. That's wait, wait, let me, <laughs> wait, let me, let me yeah. clarify that. With the mobile app, um, and, and this is designed for, you know, to get um, the information out there as quick as possible. That's why with the mobile app, it goes directly live to the site, but um, without your approval. So let me, I just want to clarify that. But the, the, the game that the, you know, say it was a baseball game, uh, if the baseball coach just finished that game, went in on, on his mobile app, it'll say, um, uh, you know, uh, Chargers Valley playing Peters Township. All they have to do is enter the final score, 3-2, hit send, boom, they're done. And you just tell them, don't write anything in there. They can go back in, um, uh, like, the next morning and write an article uh, that needs to be approved, you know, write a write-up uh, from you. But... When, when they're going in to do that, what it does is it, it creates an article based on a template from, uh, you know, that, that we provide for you for every single game that they're playing. So that's a lot of uh, work off of the athletic department, and it's immediate information out to everyone, um, you know, for, for all of the sports. So you know, getting back to that baseball coach, he, he puts that in just to score post it, it's going gonna, it's gonna to create an article on site, it's also going to go shoot through to the Facebook, uh, or your um, attached Facebook feed, 
and Twitter feed as an article as well. And again, you just help, you just um, have them, you control this by telling them just put the score in, boom, that's it. Or you can you can do all the, the posting from from there yourself, from the start. I apologize if you misunderstood that. So another great thing is um, all the coaches have to report the score, all their scores to the local media. Some probably text an email or a call. You just preload the um, the email of your local media uh, at the beginning of the year. That shoots through right to them. Uh, you know the result of of that uh, of what that that you know, of that game. Uh, it also, as Angie said earlier, it updates the record of that, that you know, that team on the team page, uh, the score of that game, the results. Uh, so just that 30 second to one minute post from their smartphone does all of that. And it works every, um, every parent or student who signed up to get alerts on that uh, individual sport of the result. So it basically is immediate information to everyone in the community, press, um, um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Put his email address in there. So, um, yeah. And we use the time saver as well. So our coaches get a sheet when we do a coaches meeting. They have like six numbers that they could call or email the score after the game. Mm -hmm. So it saves that time as far as having to do that. Um, and any yeah. other content as far as like articles and and one thing you know, I mentioned to Julie earlier is I'd like to involve students in this. Does a student want to, in a journalism class, want to do a feature on you know, a particular athlete or, or a particular student? How can we involve it into the website where we can get that out to on our site that way as well? Yeah, with, with that end of it, that's completely controlled um, you know, by Angie and whatever other administrators you would, um, you know, you would have. Uh, we have schools that the the um, the moms from the booster clubs uh, go to the games and take pictures. They, you know, snap 100 photos. They'll have access to download on the back end of the site. They don't go live until um, you know the administrators. Uh, you know, they can pick up 25 photos, boom, hit live, and they're on the site. Um, we have you can you can uh, farm this out to 100 people to contribute content on this, but nothing will go live. Other than that, gain your result from the smartphone until your administrators look at it, approve it, and then send it. And I think we can put, you know, expectations of our coaches of what, you know, what we want of after games, and with saving calling six people, I think they'd rather post one score to their, to their phone than have calls if there's six different media outlets. If anything, they'll, they'll do for that. Yeah. Have you uh, forwarded a, a copy of your contract to the <laughs> sponsor yet? Yes. Yeah. 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 And then who's, uh, who's, who's controlling what advertisers are coming on to the site? Um, I, I set up a, a meeting with Angie and whoever else wants to be in that meeting before I go out and you know secure the advertisers. But uh, it's in our, our agreement. It's, it's entirely school friendly. Um, we work with 2,000 plus schools. If we, you know, if we were um, irresponsible in getting advertisers, uh, that's our reputation. You know, so that's not something. Uh, I'm the only one that would sell ads for for the school, and um, I have uh, 27, 28 schools in Pennsylvania now, and haven't had an issue. But that, I mean, that's just. Uh, <clears throat> Career suicide for me, you know, or uh, company suicide if we, you know, uh, you know, no, no drugs, no sex, no, you know, nothing, nothing punishable. And if, if you have some businesses in the area and you say we've had, you know, that's that's why I meet with Angie to, to figure you've had bad experiences. You don't, you don't want me to go, go contact them. That's fine. Any other questions? Thank you. 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 Thank you.
So, yeah, right. So yes. when you're looking at that cohort, right. you were so in third grade. So in third grade math, they were here. 
Right, and now they're right. In so fourth when they were in fourth grade math, yeah. they dropped they the dropped. 59 59.7 percent. Yeah. Right, are now proficient. Right, right. So we did have a decrease there. So the test is a little different. Yeah, we test too much. Right. Well, so uh, so so right. try to answer your question. Yeah. Right. So why did this occur? Right. Right. So factors that go into that is that there is a it's a different test. Right. It does get a little more strenuous. But I think what we're looking at overall is looking at the curriculum that we're teaching, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, all the way through, and finding out where we had gaps in that curriculum to fix those gaps in that curriculum so that we are servicing more kids to get to keep that number at 71.5%. Because that's our goal. Our goal is to get as many kids, 80, 90 percent, to that point. So we have to drill down into the actual curriculum itself to see are we teaching appropriate materials for that? And is our instruction rigorous enough in those things? So those are the factors that we are trying to evaluate. And just receiving this data two weeks ago, that's the conversations that we're having amongst administrators and amongst faculty. And, and if you look at the cohort, if you're looking slot cohorts, right. it will be grade four, right. grade five, five. And it's not yeah, which is positive, right? So, right. And, I'm always, and, and the tests are significantly <clears throat> different from third grade to fourth grade. You know, the um, third grade is kind of that baseline, and, and you're looking at what was all the learning that occurred prior. But then fourth grade is really um, kind of a different <clears throat> test. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's sort of been like what I've noticed for the last couple of years. And I have to say, like under your leadership at the primary school, like we saw the students were coming up really strong, right? And then the third, fourth, fifth grade time frame, they, there seems to be a little bit of disconnect. And I'm not sure if there's a curriculum transitioning from different school buildings or... or I, I think there's a, a number of factors, but as Mr. Salter said, the way that we are approaching it is looking at um, curriculum, instruction, adjusting that pacing, uh, and being very uh, nimble, if you will, with how we're looking at things um, and approaching our teaching strategies using that information as well. So I, you know, that was started before I came on board, um, but I am very impressed. I have to say I'm very impressed with the staff and um, the, the curriculum leaders and the work that they've been doing at the intermediate school uh, to um, look at those areas of need um, and adjust it. <laughs> okay, so in English language arts, um, we had a very uh, nice increases as well, uh, except we had a slight dip in uh, fifth grade with our English language arts. And one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is, is a process that we're using um, uh, with our data meetings. So we're looking at multiple sets of data. Um, as I said before, we're not just looking at PSSAs, we're not just looking at um, one set of information. So we're looking at multiple sets of information and we're cross-referencing. So one of the things we're in the process of doing now is looking at our information from the PSSA <coughs> each section. And then we also give um, benchmark assessments, if you will, that are, are entered onto another site called e Doctrina, and we can compare. Okay, during the school year, how are our kids doing on this particular standard? And then we can look at the PSSA and say, how did they perform? Was it the same? Was it different? And why? And we can analyze why. So those are the kinds of processes that we're going through mm -hmm. and, and starting with uh, with staff in the campus. Any questions on the other? I'm moving for Dr. Russell. Okay. The, the effort we have made in this area, I know that we've been instrumental in doing that. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about what continues to be done in that area and how you continue to build that? For English language arts? Yes. Sure. So we started our work <laughs> last year with the IFL and what Julie was talking about as well in terms of looking at our assessments, looking at how they aligned with the standards. Um, we use something called e um, to do some of that work to assess some questions to help us. And we saw, we liked some of the questions that e offered and we didn't like some. So we actually have been developing a critical eye when it comes to our assessment questions and our assessment creation. Um, so with, just in working with the IFL, we've become a lot more aware 
of um, how to take what's in a standard and make it come alive in the classroom. And no, we're not perfect. Yes, we have work to do. But um, the, the professional learning that's been going on has been really powerful. And I think we're beginning to see, even in a year, we're beginning to see some gains. So while fifth grade didn't grow last year, you can see how it, it is similar in terms of the state trend did a little bit. But I have faith in that group of, of teachers that they will continue to work hard and make sure that they do what they can to, to lift the kids. Um, but it is definitely a group effort, and, and it's been pretty amazing to watch um, just the, the dialogue, the discourse that the teachers are having with one another and with um, the person leading the professional development to figure out, you know, how are we going to get our kids to understand this concept? What do we need to do differently? How are we going to adjust our, our instruction to get them to where they need to be? And I, I've seen that even last year, even though I wasn't involved in a lot with the math in the elementary school, I saw the same kind of conversations happening. Um, with Mac. If you remember, I'm not sure how many of you went to the walkthrough when we walked through the IS last year, and um, Shelly Burr was showing you some of the charts, they were very long, colorful charts, of all of the, the, the assessment work that they've been doing, um, and that's what Julie was referring to as well. That's, this is like our, our growth, little steps, but growing, moving forward, is really a result of a lot of that work. So, and, and we continue to do that work this year. Is the writing piece still being emphasized across all curriculum? Mm -hmm. The writing piece is emphasized across all disciplines through the SLO process, with a special emphasis, I will say, in um, probably more of the core content areas. Um, English, I mean, we're always working on perfecting our ways of teaching writing. Um, today, even, with uh, we had an IFL day where we actually brought the director from the writing project, the National Writing well, it's actually the Western Pennsylvania Writing Project, in to work with our, our English teachers on that. Um, our social studies teachers are incorporating writing through the, the DBQ process, which is um, document-based questions. I mean, they're essays. The, the kids would have to read multiple pieces of, of or multiple texts and pull evidence from text and then write about the position they're taking on whatever the issue is. In science, you'll see kids writing about um, using their claims, evidence, and reasoning in um, whatever they're studying. So that's being embedded into the assessments. And that's the other thing that's happening, I think, this year. Like, as we've gotten our feet wet, we're more um, comfortable, as comfortable as we can be teaching writing across all disciplines. We're really able to, um, to basically embed writing into more of what we're doing and into our assessment. So it's not like a standalone, all right, everybody, stop everything. We're going to do our writing today. It's really becoming more sort of ingrained in our curriculum instruction process. So it's, it's we are definitely making good progress there. It, it's not perfect, but we're making good progress there. Great. Thank you. So I'm going to skip to science. Um, so we have science in fourth grade, you'll see here, and science in eighth grade. Um, there, was a, there was growth in science in fourth grade, a dip in science in eighth grade, so we've dug into that a little bit to determine why there was a dip in, in science in eighth grade. Um, first of all, I think, that, well, you'll see that the trend, there's a, a downward trend in the state as well, so we're not alone in this. Um, we had a, a new teacher teaching eighth grade science, so that also has you know, it has some some effect. Not always a huge effect, but you know, they're learning the curriculum, or in this case, kind of coming back to it after a couple of years. Um, so, and then we're, we're looking at that. Actually, um, the curriculum leader, Sue Marino, has been working with sixth, seventh, and eighth grade teachers so far this year to figure out kind of you know where we are with science. They did some realignment a couple of years ago, and we're seeing that all right, we maybe we need to shift weather to eighth grade, and we need to shift. Other content areas to you know whichever grade that they need to be taught in. So it's it's all it's a process, but we're engaged in the process. And we're also um, looking at other departments to help us as well. What's that? We're also looking at other departments as middle school. Well, the middle well. school. So gateway to technology is an elective that a lot of kids um, take. Um, the the key to that class is that it is it includes all of the engineering standards for middle school science. So they're embedded in the gateway to technology class. Now, the science teachers 
in the middle school might and, and do cover some of those standards, but certainly don't cover all of them. So maybe the technology class is really, really critical for making sure that all of the kids get those standards. So that's something that actually Adrian and Milan are going to take a look at for next year because what we're finding is that students are getting pulled out of gateway to technology for other for other support classes. And that actually is, is probably hurting us a little bit. So we really need to take a look at that. And they are aware of that. And um, and I've already talked to Mark McAleer about that as well. So that's in, in process for next year. And is there any plans for the existing seventh graders who lost a semester of science last year? Yes, we've been having the, that's part of our conversation when we're having our sixth grade, and Robin knows this, our sixth grade conversations, our seventh grade conversations, and eighth. It's like, what are we going to do to catch the kids up? We have to really, you know, while the teachers last year did what they needed to do as best as they could, they still are, are missing depth of content because they didn't have as much time. Right. So, yeah, so a lot of that's going to fall on the eighth grade teachers right now. I mean, that's that's what the test is, but um, I think we're aware of it. That half year only happened for one year. Right, so it's just that one whole part, right? Yeah. Well, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be two. two. We'll at least have two years to pass. So, so that's was it summer as well? Okay. Okay. So, 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 so then I'll pack the some periods this year, but right. So are we doing anything for those existing seventh graders this year? We are trying to figure that out, yes. We, we know what they're missing, and we're actually, um, the teachers are able to use Study Island to assess where the kids are and what they know, what they don't know. And then um, we're, we're talking about how we can maybe customize some instruction for them and give them some exposure to some of the things that they might not fully understand because they didn't have the depth of, of instruction that they had before. Yeah. Thanks so. Okay, this is um, middle school English language arts. We had some nice growth in sixth grade and um, nice growth in seventh grade, a little bit of a dip in eighth grade. And that trend is not the same at the state level, so it makes me wonder why. <laughs> um, and again, this is something that the teachers are aware of, and we've had a conversation about this. I think that you know, the eighth grade test typically is a little bit difficult, um, but it's something that we know we have to figure out. So um, we're working on that. And again, a lot of the work that the IFL teach with the IFL is going to, I think it's going to get at that. When we're talking about text complexity, we're talking about writing, we're talking about thinking. And I think those those pieces, um, the more we continue to learn about them and embed them into our, our daily instruction, we should see growth there. Is this the last year for IFL? Probably not. Or no. <laughs> was it not from Pitt? Like, this is the second year. This is the second year. Second year. Uh, second second year. year. Yeah. Well, then we need to talk if we want to continue, continue or if we want right. to bring it to other. Other levels, like and you want to increase, right. uh, right. spread it to the primary, primary and spread it to the high school. Okay. So those are decisions we'll have to have, have another year. We have another year right now, but do we want to increase that? Yeah. Uh, because we are finding success, we are finding uh, success mm -hmm. in yeah. it. So it, it is working. It's, it's I think that, that we, it, it yeah, I think can't see for all the teachers that, that attend those sessions, but I was sitting in the English one today for middle school and. I mean, it is, it's really, you can't get, get that type of professional learning elsewhere. I mean, to have people come in, work with us, go into the classroom, stand next to you when you're teaching, and give you feedback. I mean, it, it's uncomfortable a little bit, but that's good for us. It helps us grow. So I would I would be on board for promoting that and increasing our, our, <laughs> our work with them. Um, NIMSI, the NIMSI grant ends at the end of this year. This is that might be what we're talking about. But so the NINSI, would that have impacted the eighth grade science? Or is that just about, because like some of it flow, I know it's yeah. mainly up at the AP level, but doesn't some of it flow down? Well, um, yeah, a couple of the teachers did attend the NINSI, the Langdon Foundation training this in the summer. But I don't know if that would really have a lot to do with the sports um, at this point. Um, I don't think all the teachers attended the Langdon Foundation training. So that you know that's another another factor, but um, I, I don't really think there's a huge correlation with that. Um, this is math for the middle school, and um, they were challenged. I think the board challenged them last year to raise their scores by a certain percent. Um, they buckled down and did the work, and I think you see the results. It's, 
it's we are we are above state average and we were not above state average last year and that that's huge and, and I, I know that it's been a lot of hard work for the teachers and, and for the administrators in that building but um, they have embraced that work and and they're still embracing that work so um, I think it's really powerful yeah this is a good start none of them are satisfied with it no. There's no continuing sure. um, to develop the, the techniques, the classrooms to achieve that. So uh, this is a good start. There, there are a lot of factors that go into math. Um, you know, the standards changed in like 2015. So um, the PSSAs changed to match those standards. The kids only in the middle school, at least at that time, only had those standards for a year or two or three where now the kids in kindergarten and first grade and second grade are gaining, the, the, are learning about and gaining the knowledge that they need, that they will be applying throughout their experience here at CV. So I think that's why you see all these, the numbers are low across the state. There's a lot of things that go into those scores, a lot of factors. Um, we have, the other thing that I think is, is, is something to note is, Starting with, I think, this year's ninth grader. This year's ninth graders were the first group of kids who, um, when they were going into Algebra 1 and 8th grade, uh, there was a lot of data that was used, and, and that the placement of those kids was different than, it, than what it had been in the past. Before, more kids were kind of getting pushed into Algebra 1 who weren't maybe ready for it. And I think that's also what you see when, because that group of kids are they're now going to high school. So I think that's kind of what we're seeing at the high school too, is, is those kids, you know, they, maybe they weren't ready. Maybe they missed a, a whole year of math. And that has major implications for, for our test results. This is the Keystone Algebra 1 results for the middle school students last year and this year. And year four, actually 15, 16, and 17. So you see really nice growth there. Really nice growth. And then the two on the right are state. Okay, this is Keystone, the Keystone results for the high school. So you have Keystone Algebra 1, you have biology and literature. So I think the Keystone Algebra 1 results, um, there's a, a little bit of a dip there. Um, I think this is just part of what we were just talking about, um, but it also does follow the state trend. Biology, um, a little dip, but I don't think anything to be concerned about. Um, and then the literature, a little dip as well. But for the most part, pretty steady. Mm -hmm. The next chart is on our so, AP. Let's go back and talk about okay. that. So, um, when we talk about keystones in biology so and literature. So we've always, we, for the past seven years, we've really been pushing kids to take higher level math, and higher level courses, which is fantastic, get kids more opportunities to do that. When it comes to our keystone algebra one, the difference between that and biology is that if you don't pass the biology keystones for us, you have to take another biology. If you don't pass the Algebra 1 keystone, that's, there's no other course to go with it. We don't make a kid go back and remediate an Algebra 1. But what we've done in the past, except for last year, is we had Algebra 1, Algebra 2. And so our Algebra 2 teachers did a great job of trying to work those skills that they may have missed in Algebra 1 to prepare them for when they retake the keystone so our number would be higher. This year, because we're focused on giving kids a better up on like SAT classes and other higher level math classes, there was a decision to go from Algebra 1 to Geometry and then Algebra 2. Because it, it's, it's recommended that Algebra 2 prepares kids for the higher level math, gives them a better up on the SAT scores, we're going to take the SAT scores. But it left that void in that Algebra 1 remediation that we took care that our teachers did a great job taking care of and Algebra 2, because Algebra 1 and Geometry are two different words. So I, I know the math department uh, is, is looking at that, looking at ways. They have recommendations. 
that you know if you don't pass one of the recommendations uh, is that if we don't pass the algebra one, then you go into a different math course and not write the geometry. So we can work on those algebra ones. And that's a curriculum decision that we'll have to make and improve um, eventually. And for this year, um, they also added like a Keystone Algebra One class for kids who didn't pass the Algebra One, didn't pass that Keystone last year. They they can take that elective, but it's an elective. It's not required. There's not a whole lot of kids who can fit into schedule. So the next year, if we shift and we have a requirement for those kids who don't pass the Keystone, um, that could help that addition. So that's an elective in addition to the math class they could only take right. currently. Yes. If they so choose. If they choose. And, and just a quick question on, on that chart, is that the Keystone, is that just high school Keystone students, or is that like 7th and 8th graders? This is 7th and 8th graders. That seven one's seven. Seven. okay, mm -hmm. and the next one's just high school? Right. Oh, sorry, right. so you had it, middle school and high school, sorry. <coughs> yes, yeah, so. Yeah, yeah on the top true. chart. <laughs> I was it was there. So the next um, slide is AP. So what you're going to look at here, this is from 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17. And this shows just the trend for CV. This is only CV. So you'll look at the total number of AP students over the course of those five years. How it's gone from 220 to 371. Um, the number of exams that students have taken. That's a really big jump. <laughs> really big jump. And then um, the students who are scoring or who are qualifying, having a qualifying score of a three or better. So I think I think while that that is obviously lower than the kids how many how many exams we're giving, I think what's key about this is that it speaks to the amount of college material that students are receiving over the course of the year. So while they may not get a three or better on the exam, they're still being exposed to college content. And I think that was one of the biggest reasons for doing the, you know, participating in NZ mm -hmm. and, and having this big AP push. And part of our strategic plan was to get more kids involved in, in the higher level of AP. <laughs> Have we tracked another data, though? Like, is it regarding the... the higher number, like it seems like if there's 371, that's mostly 11th and 12th graders, right? So it's up to like almost 50% of that student body. I'm just wondering, are there any doubt, has there been any noted downside to that in terms of like kids with like increased levels of stress? Yeah, and yeah. Yeah. Things like that, do we have more recourse with that? Yeah, so that's what I think is important. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
We're going to talk about two big areas. The first one is improving our multi-tiered systems of support uh, and intervention. So we used to have something called RTII, which was Response to Instruction and Intervention. That has shifted to MTSS, which is Multi-Tiered System of Support. And um, the biggest difference in that, RTI is still a part of that, and the things that you think of when you think of RTI are still embedded in there. But it's also taking a look at social and emotional learning. So, so as you were talking about, what is that other side of learning that needs to be considered? When we have a student who is having um, social and emotional issues, whether they're anger management, whether they're um, social skills, that impedes their ability to learn. It impedes teachers' ability to do the best job they can do in the classroom. So these are things that we're looking at and we're um, helping uh, with the learning on that end as well. Um, so the first thing that uh, we want to talk about that's a K-12 piece is assessment data analysis. Now, um, those of you who know me, I love the data. And we are looking at data in many different ways. We're looking at data um, for, uh, as it says here, enrichment. We're looking at it for supports. We're looking at it, um, you know, doing pre-tests to see where do our students, what do they know already, so we, we're not just marching through um, the pacing guide because it says we're supposed to march through. You know, really looking at what do our kids know and where do we want them, um, what, what can we add, how can we add value to that. <coughs> so at the elementary school, um, these are some of the major things that we're doing. Um, the first one is the reconfiguration of our reading support. So uh, probably about seven years ago now, we moved to the RTI slash MTSS system, where we went from Title I uh, reading support, and then we moved to more of a fluid system where students we would look at their information. Um, uh, we had programs that we used that were targeted based on student data. Um, and so that helped us make, tre make tremendous growth at the primary school. What we found in the last several years, you know, we got up to this point, we found a trend where um, many of our students were, we saw them again and again. So they'd come into reading support and they would become benchmark. Um, you know, they'd go into, back into the <coughs> instruction and then we'd see them again in reading support. And that pattern would, would occur year after year. So uh, in, in discussing that with our teams, uh, what we um, decided was we want to change that method of delivery. We brought, um, we brought the core of students up um, to a certain level, but now what we want to do is we want to raise that even more. So our average student at the primary school, um, what we want them, we want that, that bar to move up. So our support student, the, the profile of the support student, we want that to move up. Um, so we have, we have changed the configuration of support where students are getting sustained support throughout the year. We're starting that in grade one and two this year. Um, and so if they are in need of support, they will receive that all year throughout their, their reading block. Um, and again, the long-term goal of that is to move the bar for our average students from year to year. Um, so that's the first thing that we're doing. Uh, at the intermediate school, we're doing alignment of student services. Uh, we're looking at ways uh, for our different uh, support mechanisms to, to work together in a more cohesive procedural way uh, so that we have special education, we have reading support, we have math support, and, and they're all talking to each other and we're looking at students, you know, we have our behavior, you know, our psychologists there as well, and we're looking at all factors that are affecting student achievement down to the individual level. Um, we also are looking at uh, creating, and this is K-5, uh, individual student plan. So a student who is below benchmark, um, the teachers are looking at the area that they need to grow. Uh, we just did this uh, a few weeks ago. By January, this is where I want to get this child, and this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, so those are things that are happening K-5 in both reading and math at this time. So Julie, can I just ask, why, sure. why is it only K-5? Why is that, why, why is fifth grade sort of the cutoff for doing that? Because I think for students below benchmark, we want to also follow them. I believe it's coming next. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, 
Yep. Yeah. I'll go on the next slide. Eight. On the next one. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so K to eight, right? Uh, with ESL, one of, right. they're another support system that we have for our kids that have traditionally been in their own kind of silo. You know, they've been um, operating but not fully integrated with our other systems of support. So that's what we're looking at because um, we have students who now, um, since we have so many ESL students, we have students who maybe um, have an IEP. Uh, we have students who maybe need reading support and they're also ESL. So how do we fold all these services together? Um, move past the barriers. You know, there, there are many barriers that have been put in place unintentionally by scheduling and different things like that. So, in order to look at how do we best serve students, curriculum isn't the only thing we look at. We have to look at what are those barriers that we need to take away so that students can receive the support that they need, or the enrichment. Um, you know, not just I always support. I shouldn't say that. It, it goes the full gamut. You know, we want them to take advantage. Um, and the last thing, uh, as I said earlier, was continuing work on social emotional continuum um, and supports. So the primary school has started, they worked for about a year planning tier two, tier three interventions, and we are doing uh, core work uh, in grades K and one at the primary school. So each student receives core instruction in social emotional learning. It's a program called Second Step, and it's about uh, emotion, Anger regulation, not anger regulation at that, um, at that age, but it's um, decision making, um, how do I problem solve, uh, those are all skills that are being taught. And then, so then what happens if that's the core, then we look at, okay, what are those students that are not enough for, they might need a little more, and then how do we reinforce them, and then who are the students that need a lot more. So it gives us a system within much of it. So um, at the middle school level, we have we also have different supports put in place. Um, we have a math plus. So last year, kids uh, we did the double math. We recall. Um, so this year, some kids still need double math, and some kids don't need it. So instead of making everybody take double math, we're a little more selective going into this year. And so the kids that do need it get extra support in math. They get extra support in reading. And then also, um, Adrian and Lamont have implemented, or are in the process of implementing, um, intervention enrichment time, which they refer to as I and E. And this is a pretty powerful addition to the middle school program. Um, kids who need additional interventions can also be either selected to go to that class, or they may self-select. Maybe not, so they're probably going to be um, placed in that course. Um, and it might only be three days a week, so that the other two days a week, they can still do something that they're choosing that would be fun, that would be enrichment to them. Um, and currently, they are gathering all the different types of enrichment options that will be available to students. That could include, um, and middle school folks can help me with this, but that could include perhaps a Lego club. I think they were talking about junior achievement, um, mindfulness. Um, anyone else? Anything. There's the different <laughs> arts of uh, components to it. The athletics component, the music component, and then of course the academics. Mm -hmm. So very strong push to support the kids who need it. I'm sorry, I'm Robin Whitaker. I'm in the middle <laughs> school. See you at the podium. It's a thing. Okay, yeah, thanks. Many, many opportunities. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, they're really trying to um, reach the kids and engage them in many, many ways, as well as giving them the support they need. Um, they, they have a humongous spreadsheet that they call TAS, which is teacher, teacher Assessment of Student Progress. That's what it is. And um, they basically, they're keeping track of, so Alpha, to your point, they're keeping track of their benchmark assessments, how are the kids doing, and this is what's really helping them place kids correctly into Algebra 1. Um, into those interventions, into the math class and reading support. Um, so, so is that really just for the IME, the task that you just mentioned? Is that just for IME or is no, that no. for all of that? It's, it's for all it's of It's everything. Mm -hmm. It's for all of it. It's their place to go when they are looking at students individually. How is this child doing mm -hmm. in this grade level? The cross-discipline side. Mm -hmm. um, at the high school, uh, we talked about this earlier, there's the Keystone Algebra elective that was added, and then we're going to be making a recommendation for um, for a required course for next year. Um, Alex is another program that they use in math specifically that targets the needs of students and works them through multiple problems. Um, 
making sure that they continue to hold on to the knowledge that they have gained um, in order to move forward in that program. Also, what's not up there um, is maybe the summer. Well, it'll get to the next one. Um, they also, for at the high school, um, they in the past have used classroom diagnostic tool, which, which is a test that's aligned to like the stones. It really helps teachers identify what kids, uh, what students are, where their strengths are, and where their areas of weakness are. Um, and this has been, <laughs> been in science. It's also been done in math, and now we're doing it in English at the high school level, um, in the 10th grade in particular for, for literature, um, looking at where the kids are with content and what do we need to do as teachers to help them um, gain the knowledge that they need to to be more successful on that Keystone Literature test and just in English in general. Um, we also offer the AP mock exams. That's for anybody who's taking any of the AP classes. And um, the, the AP teachers offer tutoring. I think it's typically on Saturdays. That's something that is covered under the NINSI grant and that has been hugely beneficial. That will go away without the NINSI money, but I think we'll probably want to continue that in some way, shape, or form. Um, we also have math and science um, after school support in the high school as well, um, and that's typically it's more than one. It's, it's not one on one tutoring, but kids who need extra support a couple days a week can come for, for help in those classes. Um, in grades 6 through 12, this, the SAC program, Student Assistance Program, is also, um, they were taking a really close look at this to make sure that it's helping remove barriers to learning. And those barriers could be academic, they could be behavioral, or mental health. So um, we have a, I think, I think she's a social worker, who oversees that program, but we have teams of teachers that are on the SAC team that work <coughs> to, they basically are talking about kids who are struggling. They can be, Anybody, could, any teacher or student even, could refer, could at least let the adults know that something's happening with the student. And then that team kind of rallies around kids who need help and they try to figure out how can we help this child. Um, K-8, again, this is what Julie was saying, and, and it's on both slides because it's both. <laughs> um, but this is really the coordination of instruction for our, our ELs, our English learners. Um, Specifically, and mostly because we have so many of them in the elementary building and more and more in the middle school, honestly, and the high school, but um, we're kind of focusing right now K-8, knowing that we still need to do some more work with high school um, and helping to integrate those students into the, the classroom instruction that's happening when they're not in the ESL classroom. Okay, so our second big area that we want to talk about was um, looking at a systematic approach um, to improving our curriculum instruction and assessments. Um, Jillian and I both no, it's okay. okay. Jillian and I both uh, are on the same on the same page with really long term planning and looking at creating those systems, those procedures that are going to, to help things move. Um, and, and get us where we, we want to go. So these are some of the things that we've been doing with uh, each of those areas. So with curriculum, uh, we're continuing to revamp um, to be aligned to the VA standards. And that is not a one and done thing. That's something that we're constantly doing, looking at our, as we said, looking at that assessment, readjusting, um, saying that um, these test questions, these aren't giving us the answers or the, the information that we need. So how can we adjust them to make sure that um, we're not just giving a test and saying this is how they did, but we're analyzing what does what is that test telling us and making sure we're giving them, you know, as I heard someone over here say, we test kids a lot, you know, and so what we want to do is we want to make sure that what we're giving them is val valuable to us and, and to their education. Uh, ensuring that teachers are teaching this at curriculum, um, that's like a simple thing, but, but it's important you know, that we're all on the same page and we're all going through it. And as I said earlier, the curriculum leaders are doing great work with getting everyone on the same page. Um, at, the, at the elementary level, uh, we, are, we are endeavoring, taking on a huge endeavor. Um, what we're looking at is creating modules for ELA. Uh, and what that means is right now we have curriculum guides that show us the module, what we want to teach, what we want to accomplish in each of our areas, grammar, 
grade um, three. Many times we have different pieces that we're pulling from. Um, so we have ground that we're pulling from that and we're bringing it over. We have uh, some of our journeys that we're pulling in. Um, we might have something over here that we're pulling in. So it's not always cohesive in the instruction and delivery. We're all following the same curriculum map, but it might not be as cohesive as we would. So um, we had gone and visited uh, North Hills. They have uh, taken on a similar endeavor, and what they've done is create modules. So they're writing actually, okay, so here's my five day cycle. The, um, the read aloud or the metacognition book is this, and this is what I'm going to do with it. So that whole group core instruction is not scripted, but it's all the pieces are there. This is how you know, we're going to pull the grammar from here, and we're going to use this part of it. We're going to use this part of the writing piece. So it's all cohesive. The teachers would still have their, their individual small group time, which they will uh, program in as needed. But um, we're starting to develop those modules. And this is um, Natalie created one for third grade, and they are using it right now. And I love it. Been, yeah, they, we've gotten fantastic. Um, they, were, they were not sure of it because the level of rigor is increased. And they were not sure of it, but as soon as they started teaching it, they saw that the way that it was um, structured allowed the support. So all the kids could, could attain that success that we want them to attain because of all the things that came together. <laughs> so um, just this past week, um, Mrs. Natalie worked with uh, teachers at the primary school. So they are going to be starting that work in grades K, 1, and 2. Um, with the goal of getting modules ready for next year. So that's that's a really big endeavor, and I will post posted on that. But we feel that that, and teachers have been asking us for that. They have been asking for a way to put it all together so that what I'm doing matches what you're doing. Um, so that's what we're, we're endeavoring to do. Um, developing the pacing guides as needed, and uh, the experts. The experts, thank you, thank you, thank you, for bringing, allowing us to bring the experts in. Um, the, the level of um, thoughtfulness, the level of um, professionalism, and, and really uh, going back, many of us have not had professional development like that in a long time. Uh, so it's really rejuvenating some people, making them look at their practice in a different way, um, and I think it's extremely beneficial. Um, and then the last one, providing time for teachers to do this work. And that's important as well. Okay. okay. So I'm going to finish up with two other pieces, one on instruction and one on assessment. Um, one of the biggest pieces to this is our shift in our instructional delivery, so how we are delivering the content. We no longer, it's no longer effective for us as teachers to stand up in front of a class and constantly deliver information. We have to have kids engage with that information. We have to create opportunities for students to engage, to discuss, to debate, to write, to think. I mean, like, it has to be way more interactive than the typical model has been. You hear all about this now. You, there's several documentaries about this. Like, we have to change with the times. Kids are engaged on their phones. They're engaged. They're always engaged on their phones, actually. Too much, if you ask me. But, um, but there's, we're competing. We're competing. And so we have to find a way to, to make sure that our instruction catches, it holds their attention and, it, and is, is effective. So it's, it needs to be way more student-centered. That's what we're learning when we're engaging in professional development with all these different uh, providers. That's what I think we're learning when we're reading books and doing our action research. Um, we're just, we, as a, as a field, not just at Chartier Valley, as a field, we are evolving. We can't, we can't evolve fast enough. <laughs> we can't keep up with the technology um, and how fast that changes. But, um, but we are engaged in very rich conversation. And, and I think... Um, and our teachers are making a conscious effort to do so. Sure. Absolutely. And, and I think that's what's really great. And Julie was talking about it earlier, too. Like, it's just the, the level of dialogue, professionalism, is really impressive. I have found. Um, ongoing professional development experiences with IFL, with NIMBY, with our um, 
just different providers to the IU and um, the PTA, which is um, Primary Teacher Academy. Primary Teacher Academy, which is basically uh, it's reading, it's about literacy with primary with the primary grades. Yeah. Um, developing units of instruction, similar to what Julie was talking about, we're very much engaged in developing units of instruction, either using ones from the IFL or from NIMSI, or creating our own and embedding those into into our curriculum. Um, we get a lot of new material with those uh, providers as well, and so we're using them, trying to figure out how to make them work for us, for our students, and uh, and making sure that that we if we're engaged in the professional learning. If we are experimenting with ways that we teach and finding the best ways to do it, um, we typically see success. We, we I think that even that's what we hear in conversations that the, the, the teachers are saying, yeah, "This really worked well," or yeah, it didn't work well. I gotta like rethink that. How'd you do that? You know, th those types of conversations are priceless. Um, and then down at the bottom there, our areas of focus have been last year. This is a continuation. Um, we're looking for small group instruction. We're looking for metacognition, bringing kids into that metacognitive level where they're thinking about their own thinking, um, building stamina so that they can read. Mm -hmm. Two articles in one class period, not just one, or two pieces of text on a test, you know, not just one, and not just start staring off into, you know, out the window. Um, so that stamina is really important, and also it's it's important with writing too, not just writing three sentences. I'm done. No, did you finish your thought? Did you prove your point? So it's going to take a little bit more than three sentences to do that. So, um, and then finally, assessment. Uh, Julie talked about this. We're just doing a lot of work with assessments. We're looking at the assessments we give. We are looking at the questions we're asking. We're saying, is this what level of rigor is this question? Is it like just comprehension, or are we actually having kids do a little bit more thinking with the questions that we're asking? And are they aligned with the standards? Um, we're doing some revisions of assessments. So we're even if, and we're also developing common assessments. Last year, for instance, uh, the English department, ninth and tenth grade of high school wrote, pulled a lot of questions from NIMSI, rewrote their common assessments. This year, they're going to get them for the first time. So we're going to take a day, or a half a day, and we're going to take a look at how the kids did, and we're going to say, all right, was this question good? How did the kids do on this? Do we need to replace this question with another question? So those types of conversations, I think, are important. We want to make sure that we're asking good questions and getting good information so it can help us provide good instruction. Um, review and analyze how I talked about that, and compare this to standardized assessments and adjust reporting. So are the questions that we are asking, are they similar to what kids see on SATs, on AP, on PSSAs, on Keystones? Um, they should be. They should be. Right? Because it's not just to teach them the tasks, we're teaching them the thing. That's, that's what we're doing. So what we're looking at doing is we're looking to break this down fairly soon. Is I'm a believer that we have to be fundamentally sound. And once we're fundamentally sound, as we're, we're going through the curriculum, we're looking at that, so we want to be fundamentally sound across the board. Then we want our athletes to make plays. But our athletes are educators. And our educators came here tonight because they came. They, they saw the scores. They're not happy with the scores. They're coming here tonight, and it's my fault. There'd be more of them, but I told Frank, you know, we're in this room. But he, had, he probably turned a lot of people away because they care about our kids and they care about the product that they put out there on the street. And those are our athletes, and they're the ones that are going to make the plays for us. We have to be fundamentally sound curriculum. We have to give them the sports that they, they need to get through this because we are changing. Our students are changing. Classrooms are changing. And they're willing to change. They're taking great efforts in changing what they do, what they've done, some of them for 25 years. They're making that leap. We have to give them the support they need. So as Julie, Julie and I have talked over the past three days, we have to be fundamentally sound. So we're looking at our curriculum. We're looking at our pacing. Is our pacing correct? You know, are we, are we getting to where we need to get so we are doing better on our, on our exam? We have pushed those kids. We've created a lot of opportunities for kids. Now we need to put the supports underneath them to carry this through. 
And our goal through this is to be fundamentally sound, make sure our curriculum's aligned, make sure our gaps are closed, and let our athletes make plays. And that's our goal academic-wise. You know, we can look at a lot of things, and we, there's, there's a lot of reasons out there. We don't accept reasons as excuses. We make no excuses. Those are our scores. We own them. We know that. We don't like them. We're going to change them. Because I have faith in those people that they're going to do the best of their ability to get that done. It's my job to give them the best fundamentals to make that happen. And so that's where we are with this, with, with our assessments, but more or less what we're going to do for our kids. Because we care about our kids and we want the best for the kids. We've had great people graduate from this place. And we're going to continue to have great people graduate from this place. <laughs> Not that one. So that's our assessment report. It was only 10 minutes. <laughs> and actually, thank you very much for all the hard work. Thank you. Thank you. So that's the end of my report. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we'll move right into the solicitor's report. I, I note for the record that we had an executive session before tonight's meeting to talk about a personnel matter and a litigation matter. And following up on those discussions, if the board is so inclined, it would be appropriate to make a motion to approve the agreement and release resolving a special ed due process matter filed at ODR case number 18759-16-1701. So someone wants to make that motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? So moved. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Don. Okay. Uh, yep, four point one. We're going to uh, make a motion here. We will approve the minutes from September 12th's meeting and September 26th, 2017. Seven. Mr. Kearney? Second. Mr. Cora? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. So moved. <coughs> okay, on to our informational agenda. Education Foundation. Is so, there any update on that? Uh, they did give their give grants out. I put that in my memo. With the give grants award. <laughs> that was nice. Yeah, yeah very nice. Yeah. Congratulations Yes. Okay. Uh, Pathfinder, Mr. Kramer. Um, well, we have a really large section of roof that we're going to have to deal with at the facility. So we had um, Mount Lebanon's um, facilities director go up and take a look at it along with some roofing contractors and some roofing experts. And, um, so we're waiting on their assessment there to see how best we can handle it. Um, Is there any capital reserves? We, we do have capital reserves. We have, you know, we, we rotate four CDs that each contain about $85,000 in them. And, um, and we stagger the maturities so that we can draw on one, any one at any given time. But um, it, you know, I think we're looking at a six-figure repair. Um, it's a pretty big section of roof. It hasn't been dealt with in a long time. We've got some need to be going on. Um, so we're, we're in the middle of assessing that. Um, we re-engaged Dick Rose um, as our uh, uh, consultant to the board. His uh, same contract rate of zero. Um, <laughs> so he's, he's going to stay on board. Um, he, he was president of the board for many years over there. So he has, he has great experience. And then um, we've got a few collection issues on some maintenance fees there. So I'm personally making some phone calls to some districts to collect on a couple of bills. Thank you. Not this district. I'm not calling you. <laughs> <laughs> Very good standing. Yeah. Good that amazes me why you have yeah, you know, I volunteered. I no, mean, I mean, yeah. they can't be the coach. Yeah, no. Yeah. 
And it's not large dollars a month. I mean, 6000 That makes it worse. Well, that, yeah, it's crazy. All right, thank you. Sure. So um, at the last meeting, Dr. Copeland actually was here and did a presentation, and I think he's covered quite a bit. Parkway um, obviously has a lot of success stories to tell. Um, they had their highest enrollment. I think he had mentioned the numbers, but it's about 800 students, and, and that's the highest enrollment in the history of Parkway. Oh, that's correct. Yeah, it is. It's amazing what they've done in the last couple of years, especially under his leadership. Uh, the pass rate I'll just share for, for the NAPTI exams, 2016-2017, is 90%. Um, they are having an open house November 6th in the evening. I think it's 5 to 7. So if anyone's interested in attending, it's open to families, anyone who might want to go see the different programs that they offer. Yeah. November 6th, Monday, yeah. November 6th. Yeah. Yeah. 5 to 7. Um, 5 to 7. Okay. And then um, they recently received some grants. They're always receiving grants, so I think they, they do a good job of also trying to get additional funds. And then, um, unfortunately, just to end on a sad note here, one of their students, uh, Kiso Noakes, had a tragedy where their uh, house burnt down over the weekend. And he ended up jumping out, broke his leg, had to have surgery. And they are doing a sp spaghetti fundraiser, a pasta fundraiser. It's this Thursday from 9 to 1. Interested in attending? Yeah. Um, I think it's at the school. Yeah, at the school. Yeah. 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 We'll check that. But, um, I saw that on the news. Yeah. Very sad. But yeah. good glad that everyone is okay. And so. Julie and I have discussed about taking fifth grade field trip. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's great. Oh, that's wonderful yeah. news. Oh my gosh, because one of the things we talked about the last meeting with exposing our middle school kids even at an earlier point to the different opportunities that Parkway has to offer in the different programs. So if they, they wanted to go a different route or consider other programs, get them in early yeah. rather than rather than at the tail end of senior mm -hmm. junior mm -hmm. level. So great it's great news. Oh yeah. Darby must be so excited. We didn't talk, right? Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I won't say anything. <laughs> but that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Leslie Shazda. Oh, I do have a schedule of meetings now. So the first meeting is November, November 16th. And it's always a good one because it's when they do the legal updates for the um, you know, trending topics of <laughs> hot topics and um, education. So I'm um, looking forward to that. Thank you. Look back when I learn. Appreciate that. <clears throat> uh, Mr. Kaczynski, a finance committee report, please. Sure, we had a finance committee uh, meeting this, uh, right before this one. Um, Colleen Deere from Mock and Hawk gave a presentation on our other post employment benefits valuation. I think we talked about it a few weeks ago, but um, there was a change in uh, valuation, so it caused our the calculated liability to be increased significantly. Uh, one Point of caution, though, is that even though it is a big number, we'll look for, like, it will be on our balance sheet. Um, it is not something that needs to be exhausted right away, so we won't have to spend uh, funds in order to uh, make sure that that is funded. We do have plan assets uh, to cover those of about $3.7 million already set aside. And a good part of that is she said that the annual cost uh, to maintain the OPEB is about $320,000 a year. So that's about 10 years worth of um, Payments that we can cover, so even doing nothing, uh, we still have, right now everything stays consistent. We would have 10 years worth of payments to cover for that. So it is well funded. Uh, we are in a good spot with that. Uh, we found out that you know, some districts basically pay, pay as you go, so they got to pay it out of current operations. Where in 2011, we put up a good chunk of change ahead of time, and had it not been for the change in the gas being the way they wanted you to value the, the actual obligation, we'd probably be fully funded right now. So we're in a very good spot. Uh, we also, with Christina and Kim, looked at uh, various construction reports that they put together. Uh, I think we're going to be starting to get those very regularly. They were very transparent, um, very concise, so uh, and they were very well presented. That's it. Thank you. Okay, we'll move on to the yes. Yes. I mentioned one more thing about uh, when she said cost of dinner. I forgot the um, Pathfinder annual cost of dinner will be coming up and now. Uh, in November. I'll get the date and I'll circulate it to everyone. Um, but I did uh, 
commit the middle school hockey team again to help out and they'll be busting the tables and seeing the people and getting drinks and things. Um, you already worked through this hard last year. Yeah, they do work hard. They enjoy it too. Yeah. They get fed really well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good time. Yeah. All the pasta you remember. Yep. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's good. All right, thank you. Let us know what that is. Sure. Absolutely. All right, we'll move on to our consent agenda. Item 6.1 through 6.12. Anybody has any questions or comments regarding any of these items? Please bring them forward. So I just have a quick question on 6.5, given the last meeting and our discussion on art supply. <laughs> so, so is this with is, is this within the designated art supply budget or is it something different or Well this, this is the bit. This is just the bit. Yeah, this is within the so would be yeah, this would be capable. Okay. And it's not like this is the principal center um <coughs> get other no, people no, right, but no, this is no, just standard. Yeah, this is let's check it. I have a question on 6.12 about the prom day feature change. Just the, I know that it's been sort of, you know, all over the place over the past several years, but I know last year it was on a weekday. It wasn't due it was on a weekday. I'm wondering, does this having it on a Friday night affect the cost? Is that no, the they cost effective for the it, it, it's, cost? It's, it's better than on a weekday. Uh, so the, Friday, uh, they found finding was, a venue on was finding TV a venue was they're yeah they're able to do that they recommend the students I just figure like day. Fridays and Saturdays in June it might seem like it's like crazy. really hard because of weddings it's like right. so many people <coughs> wedding receptions right. on Fridays now and I either venue or cost of the venue might be a, yeah they didn't they didn't, that they didn't see that it was they, their request they want yeah. that okay. yeah, good yeah I I believe they feel there's less conflict. Yeah, that's time that's of why the issue has been yeah. over yeah. the past couple of years with the field. Everybody get an opportunity to read the organizational charts. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody's okay with that? Yeah. So I just had a minor comment on that. Based on some of the recent changes, like um, communication the changes staff, coming. the changes coming, um, whether when we approve it, whether it would just be approved as modified or based on the changes versus this existing version, or do we approve it with the names that are on here currently? Well, some we, positions have names and some positions don't have names. Because they have the right, right, right. So we, you know, it's really up to you guys. Do we want to have that just by position? Without names, do we want to have names? And then every time somebody leaves, we have another update at the, at the board level. You know, uh, uh, the, the one that was on our website originally was from, I believe, 2008. Yeah, so that clearly needs to be updated. Right. Yeah, I mean, I think the names are helpful as long as we are updating it. Yeah. So it's another administrative task. Yeah, yeah that's that not a difficult task. Okay, so as long as it's not burdensome. It's not burdensome. So with the names in the position, mm -hmm. and then we'll update as the as <laughs> All right. No other questions or comments regarding the consent agenda. Um, I don't have any. I don't have a question on it, but I just want to recognize um, Kim and Christina in the business office on. The quality of the reports that they put together for the the six point two the the financial reports and summaries, um, very good. They did a very nice job, and and these are really now nice and concise, and uh, we can review these quickly. And I think they'll be good for the public to see too as well um, on that. So I just wanted to recognize them uh, for exactly those. Thank you. Right. Totally agree. All right, so can I get a motion to approve uh, consent agenda items 6.1 through 6.12? So moved. Mr. Kaczynski, second by Mr. Corr. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So moved. 
Okay, on to our action discussion. Nothing there. Can I get uh, anyone in the audience who <coughs> would like to make a comment before we close tonight? Please. Sorry, I been thinking about this on my way out. Um, happy comments again. Yes, um, and it's really just safety related. <laughs> um, up at the high school um, complex. Uh, last night we were there for the girls um, soccer game and you know the weather was terrible and there was a game at six there were tons of cars well people that aren't familiar with the area they were turning around and coming down the up way and so i was just wondering if some more signage could be placed somewhere for the out of town people because the first school district there the two school districts were um bishop canavan and um Vincentian. So I'm sure they may have never been to our school before. So they probably came up the hill and figured they just went back down. Yeah, and we had some head on, like, no, you know, right. people head on <laughs> each other. Okay. And then the other thing. We'll, um, start, we'll also start to put arrows on the roads. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, that's good. The other thing I had noticed just from <laughs> going, going up there was that where um, the I use where, where the, um, when you get to the top and you have the walkway that you have to cross and go into like the, where they have the orange fencing up and stuff. Sometimes, I was just wondering, sometimes depending on what type of vehicle is parked right next to, like in that very last spot, you can't tell if kids are coming out until they're out on the street. So I was wondering if there was a way to sort of maybe angle the fencing so somebody could not park in that last spot. Yeah, or just pull off the parking. Do, do, you know, do, you, do you know what I mean? Yes. Like if you go up there? Right. Yeah. Um, I've had it happen before um, when I dropped my daughter off for band and the kids are coming from the back parking lot and um, they're crossing, they're getting right there and there's a bigger vehicle and you don't even realize that they're coming until they are right out the street. So I just wanted to point that out. We're also going to put stop signs here. So okay. People have to stop there. Oh, well, that'll be great too. But, okay. Thank you. Thank you. So thank, thank you. you. That's going to be challenging for the weather change. The weather change. This is a third at the problem. I can see yeah. the rain and snow is going to get challenging. Anyone else? Okay. Can I get a motion to adjourn? So, Mr. Curry, Mr. Carroll, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? 